Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Good. If you're just joining us this morning, we started this kind of weekend conference with Joel last night. My name is John Reiner. I'm one of the pastors here. Just a couple little updates. We mentioned it last night. There is a book table in the back corner. So Joel has brought three of his books here. Um, information about cost, but he just wanted to make them available. So you can scan the QR code to give on Venmo. Otherwise, there's a cash box back there as well. So Carrie is in the back. She can help you with the... Carrie and Kelly. There's Kelly with the book table. Also, if you would like to give towards uh, Joel and his ministry, you can do that either in person with our giving boxes. We'll also have people in the back at the end of each session that you can drop a cash or check donation. Or you can go online at firstfree.org slash give. And there's a little drop down box that says goodwill offering. So anything that comes in goes towards Joel in this event. So First Free doesn't take any of that or profit off any of that. That's all going back to Joel. So if you would, please welcome Joel to start off our morning session. Thanks, sir. There we go. Good morning. <clears throat> I just woke up about 15 minutes ago. I'm just kidding. No, thank you all for coming out. Um, so the way that we've got this morning structured is it's actually, um, it goes from nine to noon. Hey, real quick, John, are we going to do any other than teaching between now and noon? Is there anything else? No worship, nothing. Okay. So let me um, think about that because you've all got nine to noon blocked off, although that's a lot. Um, this particular message, I'll probably break it at least into two, but there's no way that it'll take us all the way to noon. And they said, eh, if you get early, that's fine. So we'll see how it goes. Um, that's a lot to sit through for three hours. So the title of this message <clears throat> is a bit unusual. Um, I just share, I've just shared this a few times at a few different churches, so forgive me if any of you have tracked with it. I don't think I've I don't think I've reposted it on social media, but the title of the message is Apocalyptic Evangelism, which is, a, as I said, a bit of an unusual title. Now, again, just to be clear, everything that we're talking about this weekend revolves around Israel. It's really, as I said, since the events of October 7th, my heart has absolutely been broken, not only for what Israel and the global Jewish community is experiencing right now. I mean, I, you know, again, just to put it in context, imagine you're sitting down to eat your Christmas dinner and then terrorists burst into your house, kill a handful of your family members, drag off the women and teens, and then the whole world celebrates. And you're going, what in the world is happening? And they're looking and they're saying, who has a shred of sanity out there? And that's why it's so important. For, and half of the church is actually going, well, yeah, and they're actually supporting the insanity. And there's nothing more important that when you're getting kicked that you have friends. And so it's so important that we as followers of Jesus understand this. It's a basic, to me, you know, <clears throat> sorry, I'll just go on a little rant. My, the friends that I mentioned last night, my guy friends, um, we have a thread, and one of my good buddies that I've known forever, he converted to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy some years ago, and um, I actually have a real affinity, there's aspects of Eastern Orthodoxy that I love, there's incredible just beauty in it, and you know, the, the chants, and the liturgy, and even the iconography, and the incense, if you're a hippie, you know, you're like, I love the incense, Reminds me of high school. No, um, but there, you know, every, I don't care if you're a Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Charismatic, Baptist, whatever. I don't care. There is no perfect church out there. And that's the thing in Orthodoxy, like it's a perfect church. But one of the biggest problems within Orthodoxy is there is brazen anti-Semitism, hatred of, of Jews. And that comes, quite frankly, from the church, the historical church. You know, you see anti-Semitism throughout the history of the Christian church. At pretty much any century you can go, you'll find leading theologians saying really derogatory, hateful things toward the Jewish people and using theology to justify it. 
So my heart was absolutely broken and immediately, like within a day of the slaughter having just happened, over 1,200 Israelis just murdered, my friend immediately starts commenting on our friend's thread about how it was all a false flag event and that the Jews planned it in order that they could justify mistreating the poor, suffering Palestinian people. And here's a very dear, close friend of mine of 30 years, and I just snapped. And I just, and he's like, immediately jumped onto me, and he said, well, because of your theology, you defend the Jews because you have a theology like John Hagee or all of you charismatic evangelicals, you guys just have this weird eschatology view of the end times that makes you think you need to support Israel no matter what. <clears throat> and I said, no, it's because I'm a human, Adam. Sorry, I love my friend. It, it's because I'm a human. This is a simple matter of humanity. We as followers of Jesus, first and foremost, are followers of Jesus but if it doesn't lead us to become good humans, okay, I'm not a humanist, but if it doesn't lead us to be good neighbors, then what is our faith worth when people are being slaughtered and the whole world is under the spell of a satanic, demonic ideology they're celebrating in the streets? If it doesn't lead us to stand with people in that moment, then our faith is worthless, quite frankly. I mean, this is just basic humanity. So my heart's been gripped. My heart has been absolutely broken. And so pretty much anything that I talk about is going to revolve around it. And much of what we're talking about this weekend now, back to apocalyptic evangelism. What in the world does that term mean? This is a term that um, my friend Reggie Kelly first coined. Some of you may know the name Reggie Kelly. He's absolutely brilliant, amazing teacher. There's a lot of different forms of evangelism. Evangelism is when we're trying to appeal to unbelievers to embrace and accept what we believe. It's a pretty interesting job that we've been given, isn't it? We're trying to convince people to change their entire belief about everything and embrace a new religion. That's such a no-no thing in modern sort of culture. Um, there's evangelism. You could also say um, apologetics. So apologetics, you've got polemics and apologetics. Polemics, let's say you're having a debate. Let's say I'm having a debate with a Muslim. If I make fun of Muhammad or point out flaws in their worldview or theology, if I'm attacking their religion, tearing down their religion, deconstructing their belief system, that's called polemics. It's negative. You're pointing out the negative things about a philosophy or a religion or a worldview. Apologetics are the positive things that you're laying out to defend the faith. Apologetics. So you've got a lot of great apologists out there. Um, that's their full-time ministry. I think of men like Frank Turek, um, uh, what's his name, uh, he wrote all the books, but now his son's kind of, McDowell, uh, Sean McDowell's taken over for his dad, Josh McDowell, great apologists, um, you know, they, they've dedicated their lives to laying out all of the philosophical, historical um, reasons to believe the Christian faith, to believe the Bible. And I, when I first got saved in particular, I really loved apologetics because it strengthens your faith. You go, yeah, that, you know, and to be honest, one of the greatest apologetic works ever was C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. If you've never read it, it's just such a good book and, because he has very simple, piercing thoughts, you know, where he goes, look, bottom line is the things that Jesus said, he doesn't allow us to view him as just a, a wise teacher. Either he is God or he is crazy. No other options. You can't go, well, he was a good teacher. Like, he forces us to either accept him as God Almighty and the Messiah and the King of Israel, or he's a lying, false lunatic or a liar, Lord, liar, or lunatic. 
little points like that that you go, yeah, I, I have to make, uh, you know, I have to accept one of these things. But when you read the New Testament, when you actually read the, the manner in which Jesus, John the Baptist, and the apostles defended the faith, it was not primarily through philosophy. Paul, the apostle, a little bit. He's like, look, creation itself testifies to these things, you know, and I love that at the beginning of Romans. But overwhelmingly, the single great, there's really two, two primary um, tools that the apostles used to defend the faith. The first one, and this is not what the message is about, but the first one is the activity of the Holy Spirit, period, is miracles. Jesus, you know, walks into it like nothing gets your attention more than a truly accurate prophetic word from heaven that no one could know that gets your attention now the rest of whoever this person is whatever the rest of what they say they've got your attention they call you a oh, ma'am you know name your children or some prayer that you're privately been agonizing with the lord and suddenly someone calls it out and you go oh that's god like that person couldn't just randomly make that up or supernatural healings, right? You know, I always think of the example where they're in the temple. I guess it's John and, and uh, Peter, I believe, John. Anyway, and, you know, silver and gold. I don't have any silver and gold to give to you. But what I do have, I give to you freely. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk, and boom, bones shift, and someone gets healed, and they're like, you can, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's clear, a voice from heaven. Okay, so the activity of the Holy Spirit, I just want to be very clear, is really the single greatest apologetic for the faith. And in the charismatic world, we believe these things, but I really believe that even at an, a moment in time, when so much of the charismatic Pentecostal world is being eviscerated, um, in my opinion, by the Lord himself, we need to push into the Holy Spirit, not withdraw. You know, we need to recognize there's a lot of abuses and problems that come with that, okay, that comes with the territory. We need to grow in maturity, but we can't shrink back because this is the way that God, the God of heaven, has chosen to reveal himself to mankind, and he asks us to actively partner with him in that, in the same way that the apostles did. And it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. You know, there's a reason that God put in the Bible, don't despise prophetic utterances. God put it there because it's easy to despise. It's easy to hate. It's easy to get frustrated with it. He goes, don't do that. Okay, so the activity of the Holy Spirit, number one, I just had to do a little mini sermon, but the second most significant tool in the arsenal of Jesus, John the Baptist, the apostles, anyone in the Bible that themselves, it was not philosophy, it was not, you know, argumentation and all of these different things, it was this, biblical prophecy being fulfilled right in front of their eyes. And their ability to open the scriptures in front of people and say, listen, and do a sermon and an explanation. You see it in the book of Acts. You see it with Stephen. You see it with Paul. You see it with Peter. They lay out what's unfolding right in front of the people. And they go, guys, look, what you see today, this is to fulfill the words of the prophet Isaiah who said this. And then they expound what the prophet said, and they point to events that are unfolding in the earth, in the news, or on the ground right in front of them, and explain, this is that. What you see right now, this is that which God spoke through the prophets. I quoted it last night. It's a common phrase. As was spoken of through the mouths of the prophets of old. And so this is something that you will not see in a Josh McDowell book, or at least as far as I know. It's not an appeal to biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy within the church is viewed as this other weird subset of stuff that we talk about. We come on Saturday morning, we talk about biblical prophecy, or we talk about Israel or this sort of thing, but you won't see biblical prophecy being discussed at the apologetics conferences. Yet that 
was, again, other than the activity of the Holy Spirit, that was the single greatest way that the apostles validated this book and ultimately the God who inspired this book. It's the greatest way that they convinced people to change their entire worldview, to change their religion. That's a big thing that we would ever expect anyone to do. I'd say change your worldview is probably a better view because many of them already consider themselves Jews or, you know, subscribers to Judaism. But now it's, it becomes clear that it has to be the center of what's driving your life, etc. right? So this is discipleship. You could say evangelism. You could say discipleship. You could say apologetics. But I'm calling it apocalyptic evangelism because now more than ever... Listen, a few years ago when COVID kicked in, uh, some friends and I, um, we said, look, the whole world right now, the whole world, the unbelieving world is fascinated and gripped by the idea of the end times. Like, I don't know if you all remember the feeling, we all had different experiences, but I remember going to the supermarket just before COVID and it was like, you, it was kicking in and you didn't know, and everyone was standing in line looking at each other like, holy crap, this feels like the end of the stinking world, man. Like, this feels like a movie. Everyone's wearing masks. We're like looking at each other like, did you get the last toilet paper? I don't know, why do we even need toilet paper? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it was just crazy. Like, it was such a weird moment. And the whole world, I don't care what their faith was, they were gripped by interest in the end time. And we're still there in many ways because... It just, that whole thing just snowballed, you know, and then all of a sudden everyone's like, you know, everyone became conspiracy theorists and, and so forth. And so here's the point is as we, as the church, I don't know if you could see that. Um, we, as the church, we have the ear of the world right now and world events war unfolding world events are stirring the hearts of even unbelievers. And we are the ones that should be able to open this book and explain to them, guys, what you're seeing unfold in the earth right now, this is that which the prophet spoke of. And yet the reality is the majority of the church today does not have the ability to clearly open the Bible, you know, to look out at some event. Now, let me just rephrase this. If you go on YouTube, you get guys that every single stupid little news event, they're like, breaking, breaking biblical prophecy. And you're like, no, I, um, let me try to think of an example. Yeah, I mean, just there's a weird subset within the world of prophecy where every single stupid news event, they try to point to some random prophecy. That's not what we're talking about. I'm, so, I'm talking about opening up the prophets in a responsible manner and actually expounding what they actually say as opposed to, oh, Joe Biden just said this. Hunter Biden just said this. I wonder if Jeremiah had anything to say about what Hunter Biden just said. You know what I mean? You go, no, that's not what Jeremiah was focused on. I remember when 9-11 happened, people found some random verse. I think it was in Isaiah somewhere that talked about the towers falling. And they're like, oh, that must be this. I'm like, that has nothing to do with what Isaiah was referring to. The Bible is not some manual that, that you know, oh, it, oh JFK got assassinated. Oh, <coughs> maybe there's something in, in Hosea about that. No, it's not some manual that points out every stink. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> some random event that happens in the news. But there are large events that are unfolding right now in the earth that are very specific very specific, and they are clearly spoken of repeatedly and consistently throughout the biblical narrative. And much of the church today doesn't understand it. They're not able to connect the dots. We need to be educated believers who connect the dots. So I'm going to talk about a handful of things that are unfolding right now in the earth that if we have discernment, if we understand the scriptures, we should be able to connect the dots and explain these things to our neighbors or even to other Christians that are in the church that, you know, maybe you're on the fence, maybe you're skeptical, or maybe you just don't understand these things. We need to understand these things. And it strengthens our own faith. 
It helps us to be better evangelists, to call people into the house of God, and also it strengthens our own faith, but it also helps us to understand how do we respond rightly to these things, right? As these things are unfolding, what should be our response? Not just, oh, I know that's biblical prophecy. What should I do? How should it affect my life? Okay, long introduction. I'm going to start out with a chart, a chart that I just threw together, and I call this the chastisement cycle, and I'm speaking of the blessings and the curses of the Mosaic Covenant. Whoa, you just jumped into some pretty heavy technical stuff right out of the gate. It'll make sense. Last night, I talked about the Abrahamic Covenant that God made with Abraham. He swore, God himself swore on his own life. It's very simple, just covenant, just think promise. Just think promise unto death. Okay, you made a, if you get married, you made a marriage covenant. Unto death do us part. That's the marriage covenant. When God makes a covenant, it's usually unto death. It's just a promise. Just think of God made a promise. So he made the Abrahamic covenant where he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and your children will possess this land forever. It was a, ready? It was a unilateral promise. God promised. It was not, if you do this, Abraham, then I will do this. It was not a bilateral two-party agreement. It was a unilateral promise from heaven. I'm going to give you this land forever. We also touched on and looked at the Davidic covenant where God, it was essentially a reiteration of the Abrahamic covenant, which is the Davidic covenant. When God promises to David, he says, out of you, from your body, one, well, yeah, he, yeah, he does say that. He says, your seed after you will rule on your throne forever. That was actually an expansion of the Abrahamic covenant. How are your people going to possess the land forever? They're going to possess it forever because I'm going to give you a king who will rule over and, and express dominion over the land. It's through the son of David. It's through Jesus. Okay, so you got the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, but right in the middle of that, you have the Mosaic covenant. This is the covenant that God made with Israel through Moses. That's why it's called the Mosaic covenant. Sometimes we call it the Sinaitic covenant because it was made at Mount Sinai. The Mosaic or Sinaitic covenant is different than the Abrahamic or the Davidic. The Abrahamic and the Davidic were both unilateral. God just made a promise. He never says, if you, then I. He just says, I'm going to do this. The Mosaic covenant, on the other hand, was very different. It was very much a bilateral agreement between two parties. God entered into, and really, if you have read my book, Sinai Design, then you know this, or you may know it regardless, but it was a betrothal, or you could even say a marriage covenant. The covenant at Mount Sinai was a marriage covenant between God and Israel, but technically it was a betrothal covenant, because betrothal is like, in the Bible, we, today we do, we're engaged, and then we get married. In the Bible, they would get legally betrothed and then later you would consummate and, and move in together and join all of your property and so forth at the marriage and there would be a big party and celebration, but it's a little bit different. But the covenant itself is the betrothal, okay? And so God entered into a betrothal, you could say a marriage covenant with Israel, okay? But as, the, as, the, as I said, it's a bilateral agreement. So Torah, or the law, is within this framework, and this is not something I'm just making up, it's something the Bible clearly uh, establishes. Torah, or the law, are the wedding vows. So in modern times, when we get married, we have the wedding vows. I'm going next week to go marry a childhood friend of mine. It's hilarious. I'm sorry. I just have to tell you this. It's just, it's, um, but this will be on. Yeah, no, it's cute. So, okay. When I tell all of my war stories from before I got saved as a teenager, like if you get to know me, I've got a lot of war stories and they're bloody. 
not bloody, but they're crazy. A very prominent character in most of my stories, like he is a legendary figure. His name is Ed. <clears throat> Ed, well, he probably wouldn't mind me saying this. Something wrong with that boy, okay? We never quite knew what it was, medically speaking, but just something wrong with that boy. And something was wrong with me, too still is, but regardless, Ed is like just the legendary figure of my childhood. Well, you know, I got saved, I moved to the Midwest, I kind of broke ties with most of my buddies, you know, my drug buddies and so forth. It was me trying to, you know, maintain, you know, to kind of stay away from that influence, just knowing. So 30 years later, after getting saved, Ed reaches out and he says, um, hey, um, can you uh, marry people? And I was like, well, I mean, I'm not technically ordained, but you, you, know, you can go online and get ordained. And he said, so, yeah, I, can, I, could, I could officiate a wedding. He's like, cool. I told uh, my girlfriend that I, if, if you would do it, I would get married. And so I was like, let's do it. And I said, so how long have you guys been dating? He goes, a few weeks. And so I was like, all right, cool. And he's like, I mean, I just figure whatever. We're in our 50s. May as well just do it. And so I went home. It was actually for like a funeral. And so I went to Ed's house. And um, he actually lives with his dad. I mean, actually, now his dad's in a nursing home. But so I went to his house. I actually, I drove Ed home because he, he doesn't have a license. But um, when I got there, I don't know. I'm telling you the story, but I'm sorry. His yard... When we were kids, he always loved um, these Suzuki Quad Racer 500s. So, you know, like a four-wheeler. He kid was crazy. He had 13 of them in his yard. N none of them ran. 13. 13. And a few boats. And a few cars. And a few other things. And a couple sheds. And the yard had not been mowed ever. And I said, so where do you guys want to get married? And he goes... I don't know, I was just thinking in the yard. <laughs> so this is just beautiful. Like, I am clearly going to post pictures of this on social media. And so I said, well, cool. I said, now, I said, the only thing, though, Ed, um, you know, is your bride cool with getting married in the yard? Because, um, I mean, I'm just, I mean, like, you might want to clean it up a little bit. Like, we can do some string lights in the trees or something, make it look romantic. But... Um, he goes, yeah, you're right. I don't know, maybe we could just do it out in the woods or something. <laughs> so I was just like, this is going to be great. Okay, I had to tell you that. Because it's coming up, like, next week. Is it, I'm not sure if it's next week. It's either next week or the week after. What was I talking about? And God made a covenant with Israel. Oh, okay, the marriage vows. So I've been getting on them. Have you guys written your wedding vows? Thank you. Um, we today, when we get married, we go, like, we write our wedding vows, and it's usually more, like, emotional and poetic and romantic. We go, like, you know, it, again, whatever. I promise to stand by your side and thick and thin. I'll be a rock in the storm and, you know, whatever. It's, it's nice. Biblically speaking, when they got married, it was a, the wedding vows were legal, contractual obligations that you signed, all right? So it's, you know, it was property related. It was like, here are the things that I will do. I promise I will not leave my underwear all over the floor. This is Torah. Like, I will put up the toilet seat. If I fail to do these things, the penalty is death. I'm kidding. But really, like that's Torah. So we look at Torah and we think, oh, it's just a bunch of rules. But biblically speaking, it's the marriage vows. And it, the marriage vows are a beautiful thing, okay? It's just, again, for Christians to understand what Torah is in the story and Torah is just, you know, the, the, the Mosaic Covenant, it is the foundation of the entire, like, 
most Christians, we, we just look at it strangely. We don't really understand it. It is the foundation for everything in so many ways. The Abrahamic covenant, yes, but the Mosaic covenant. Okay, so the chastisement cycle, the reason I call it the chastisement cycle is because I didn't want to call it the curse cycle. So you have two things. You have the blessings and you have the curses of the covenant. Now, I don't like the word curse because it sounds like something a witch or a wizard does. I curse you. Like, what, what is a curse? But this is the word that most Bible, English translations translate. But really what it is within the Torah, within the, the covenant, is you have the blessings of the covenant and you have the chastisements of the covenant. It's very simple. We're going to look at some scripture just to lay this out. The blessings are very simple. If, again, it's bilateral. If you... If you obey, if you listen, if you are careful to listen to my words and heed my instructions so as to do them and carry them out, then I, if you, then I, if you obey me, then I will bless you. And he goes down the list. It's your crops will be blessed. You'll have peace with your neighbors. The wild animals will all behave. You know, you won't have some investation of locusts or whatever it might be like i will give you rain in due season and he kind of lists all of the basic necessities of life particularly in an agrarian farming society ancient farming society i'll give you rain in due season your crops will be blessed in the spring you'll have so much blessings you'll still be harvesting from the fall you know this type of thing and then he always ends it with a statement similar to this you know, like, I'll give you rains, you'll have peace with your neighbors, you'll have security, I'll plant you in your land. And then he ends with a statement, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And that really, that phrase embodies everything that came before it. But it's the most important. I will be your God. Of all the peoples in the earth, of all the gods of the earth, most importantly, I will be your God, you will be my people. Okay, that's the essence of Torah. If you obey me, if you listen to my instructions, you'll be blessed, and I will be your God. Okay, then you have the curses or the chastisements. Again, we're going to look at those in detail. But it's basically, if, but if you don't obey me, if you don't obey me, here's what's going to happen. And it's a series of chastisements. Now, the reason I don't like curse, as I said, is curse is just some kind of weird thing. Like, I curse you, and then from that day forward, you know, my elbow hurt or something. You know, the witch cursed me. That's not what we're talking about. God says, if you don't obey me, here's what's going to happen. Bad things. It's real simple. Bad things will happen. And you could say that they are just the natural outworking of disobedience to God. So let's just say today, you go, should I obey God or should I be an alcoholic? I'm going to choose to be an alcoholic. Okay, fine. You're going to feel the ramifications of your own choices. Okay, bad things happen when we disobey God. It's that simple. Sometimes when you obey God, you know, in the church it's taught if you just obey God, good things will happen, but it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes there are painful costs to obeying God. Sometimes there's persecution. Sometimes you can still get sick and have tribulations and have problems with your kids and have tragedies and all of those things. But righteousness demands that we still respond properly. So I don't, I'm, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. But there is an element of, but when we obey, life is better. When you're not an alcoholic, when you're not a drug addict, when you're not cheating on your spouse, life is much better. Okay? But there's more than just the natural implications of our actions. There's also God saying, and if you don't do this, I'm going to send this. I'm going to send that. You're going to be invaded. Your crops are going to be horrible. I won't send rain in due season. You're going to plant your seeds and they won't bear fruit. And then he goes, and I'm going to send. Ultimately, it's, it's basically like he starts out with little warnings. Little warnings. And then it gets worse and progressively worse. So actually jump back real quick to the um, chart. The cycle, it's important for me just to highlight this is a cycle that we see play out multiple times throughout. If you read the book of Judges, Chronicles, Kings, you see the cycle play out in the life of Israel. They commit themselves to the Lord. We will obey. 
God, we remember we forgot your commandments, we forgot your covenant, but now we stand here solemnly in front of you, you know, in the temple. We commit ourselves to you. We will obey. And by the way, these things were written for us as well. We can see ourselves in this story. Like we go to the altar, whatever, we commit ourselves to the Lord. After a season, two, three, four, five years, all of that zeal, commitment, we compromise, whatever it might be, we slowly, subtly fade into, into being backslidden. And that's a slippery slope. And then, you know, you could look at it in the history of Israel or our own personal lives. You could look at it in the life of the United States, our own nation. And then the Lord says, I'm going to start warning you. I'm going to start letting you feel the impact of your own disobedient decisions. And so you start out, let's see what, I can't read that from here. Um, okay, so you return, they return to the Lord. They dedicate themselves to the Lord. And then eventually they backslide over there in the blue as they fall away. The Lord sends the calamities, the chastisements. They increasingly get worse and worse and worse. I would argue that 9-11 for us as a nation was one of the most significant, clear voices from heaven. You go, no, that was Satan. I go, yeah, it was Satan, but it was also God. He was warning the nation. And in many ways, what's strange is he sent the terrorists from the east. In the Bible, he sends the Babylonians. Even the ISIS or Al-Qaeda, they're basically modern-day Babylon. He's sending out little, little um, I don't know what you would call it, you know, little teams from Babylon, but eventually the whole army comes. Eventually the whole thing collapses. Eventually it just is destroyed. So with Israel, he says, you know, I won't, you, won't, you won't have rain, your crops will be, and then I will send this. And if you don't pay attention, then I'll send it worse. And if you don't pay attention, eventually, and this is what he says, it's very clear, it's very specific, I will invade your land, I'll send the Babylonians or whoever it might be, and he says, and you will be completely destroyed. Now, when he says that, what he means is most of you will be killed. And then he says, and I'll take the few that are left and you'll be exiled among the Gentiles. You'll be scattered like prisoners of war or kidnapped, whichever term you want to use, and you will be exiled among the nations. And then he goes, he goes I'm going to do this. And this is why I use the word chastisements because we don't curse our children. We chastise them. We punish them, but it has redemptive goals. Good parents actually discipline their children because we're trying to teach them wisdom. We're trying to teach them life lessons so that when they get older, they don't end up in jail or suffer or have more pain. We're trying to teach them important life lessons now to prevent them from suffering more later. But it's, the goal is, is redemption. God's chastisements with Israel, the same thing. He's trying to teach them wisdom. He's trying to, he's trying to call them into that relationship with him. Okay, so he goes, you'll be invaded. The Babylonians will come. You'll be exiled among the nations. And then he goes, and after a while, there in your pain and your suffering and your brokenness, you'll remember me. You'll remember me. And that's, you know, man, I really hit rock bottom. Yeah, most of Israel got killed. There's very few left. You're now living over there in Babylon. And in your brokenness, you remember me. And then he goes, and then he says this. And you'll see it. We're going to read the scriptures. He goes, because I will never forget the promise that I made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I promised I'm going to give you and your descendants this land forever. And he goes, and after you remember me, I'll bring you back to the land. Again, because I made a promise that I'm giving you this land forever. Okay, so do you see how God's promises, they're very specific? When I say specific, it's not just, they're not general. They're not vague. They're not just like, you'll be blessed. He's like, most of you will be killed. A few will be left. You'll be exiled among the nations. But eventually, you will return to your land. You'll return to your land. So very specific. And the reason I'm highlighting the specificity of his promises is because, again, we're dealing with apologetics. We're dealing with evangelism. We're dealing with proving that the God who spoke in the pages of this book is actually the God of all creation. Okay, it's not a parlor trick. 
It's not self-fulfilled prophecy. It's not something that can be manipulated. He, he programmed in this book tests that we can look at after the fact and say, there's no way anybody could have faked that. This could only have come from heaven because we're dealing with thousands of years and things that just can't be manufactured. Again, there are some good tricksters out there that can fake prophecy. If you're a skeptic, you think through these things. You go, is there any way? Because that person, what they just called me out and they gave me details about my life. Is that information somewhere on Facebook? Is there a way that that person could be a deceiver? You know, or is there no way in the world that that person could have known the things that they just shared? Or is there a chance they just randomly, coincidentally happened to get it right? You know, and you go, no. What they just called out were things that I was just praying to the Lord privately and I've told no one just yesterday. You go, that word was from heaven. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we are actually called to test prophecy. Not to be overly critical, but to be skeptical. That's okay, to test these things. Okay, so let's go ahead. Leviticus 26, let's just review some scripture. We're going to look at... um, This is actually Leviticus 3 through 5. If you walk in my statutes. I'm not sure if you have it there, but this, I'll just read it. The Lord says, now here it is. If you, then I. Okay, so we're dealing with the blessings. Very simple. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out. I love that he adds, so as to carry them out. It's not just, if you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you believe the things, if you believe the gospel and live it. We're not saved if we just acknowledge something. Even the demons believe these things, right? Faith without actually affecting our lives isn't the kind of faith that saves us. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to actually carry them out, then I, if you, then I, I will give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce, the trees of the field will bear their fruit. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. You'll live in your land, your bellies will be full, and you won't be stressed and have anxiety and worried about an invasion. If you obey me, you'll have peace and security, which is ultimately what humans long for. Right? Everybody just wants a safe piece of property that they can raise their family, raise their children as gently as they can. Now let's talk about the curses of the covenant. This is Leviticus, oh, sorry, there you go, you got it. Now, Leviticus 14 through 17, just several verses later, the Lord says, but if you do not obey me and do not carry out all my commandments, if instead you reject my statutes and your soul hates or abhors my ordinances so as not to carry them out, all my commandments, so as to break my covenant, I will do this to you. He doesn't say, Satan's going to do this to you. He goes, here's what I'm going to do as a loving father. Now, again, this is just the universal argument. So is it God or Satan? Satan is God's Satan. You know, as the old preacher joked, God and the devil are after me, which sometimes is how it feels. But the point is God is sovereign. He's the ultimate one that's behind everything, even the pain, even the tragedy. That's a really hard thing when tragedy strikes. God could have prevented this, but he allows these things. He goes, I will in turn do this to you. I will appoint over you sudden terror, consumption, and a fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. It's a powerful, it will cause your soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly. Your enemies will eat it up. Whatever the work of your hands, your enemies will enjoy the fruit of your labor. Your enemies will eat it up. I will set my face against you. Like God of heaven says, I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you will rule over you. Is there anybody here who hates the Kansas City Chiefs? Get ready to be dominated. Your enemies will rule over you. I'm just kidding. Actually, it's going to be a tough game. Deuteronomy 4, 24 through 31. So we just looked at Leviticus. Same thing reiterated in Deuteronomy. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. 
the concept of fire, that the Lord defines himself as a fire. It's, you know, the God is a God of object lessons. It is one of the most terrifying, poignant analogies in all of scripture. God himself is a consuming fire. Like fire, when you think of our lives, when you think of people, how precious the person sitting next to you is, all of the desperate memories and emotion and how much the value of a person. And then you look at what fire does to something. It reduces it to nothing. It's gone. It's ashes. Like fire is such a terrifying thing. And God says, I am a fire that consumes. And it's ultimately why it's out of his jealousy for us to enter into right relationship and obedience. Like, it's just fire. You know, we pray I, as charismatics, Lord, send your fire. I don't pray those prayers. Like, I hate fire. It's terrifying. God is a jealous God. He, we, we also, we talk, we go like, jealousy is a petty human emotion. God's not jealous. Yeah, it says jealous, but he's not really jealous. God chose to reveal himself as a jealous God. And the language of God using that, saying I'm jealous, it starts out at the covenant at Mount Sinai when they enter into the golden calf idolatry. From that point afterwards, he, because he's a jealous, he's like a husband. He goes, you broke my heart. He chooses to reveal himself, not just as this, all-powerful, stoic God in heaven. He chooses to communicate and reveal himself to us as an emotional, broken-hearted person who actually cares, who has jealousy, who cares about us and our obedience to him. Like when we're disobedient, it breaks his heart because he wants the best for us, just like a parent who our hearts break when our kids are wandering or posting inappropriate pictures on Instagram or whatever it is that your kids do. That's what my kids do. I'm like, ah, delete that. Pastor follows you. She's like, all the kids pose in their bathing suits. I'm like, that's not even a bathing suit. Anyway, sorry. I got distracted. God is a jealous God. When you, and then here he is. When you become the father of children, so now the Lord through Moses He's actually prophesying. He's not just warning. He's actually saying, here's what's going to happen. Because when you guys enter the promised land, when you become the father of children and children's children, another couple generations pass, you've remained long in the land and act corruptly. You know, he's saying when you do this, but he's basically saying, here's what's going to happen. You guys are going to go in the land. A few generations are passed. And guess what? You're going to start cheating on me. You're going to be unfaithful when you make an idol. The embodiment of disobedience, in the same way that the end of obedience to God is, I will be your God, you will be my people. You know, in a, again, to use the romance marriage analogy, it's like, you will be my one and only, one and only. On the opposite side is disobedience, the culmination or the end of disobedience is you will actually go out in the woods, cut down a tree, carve it, lay it with gold, put it on your shelf and worship it and bow down to it. it look at, he goes, when you make an idol, it, it, you will worship that which is not a God. You will worship demons if you obey me, the end, the ultimate embodiment of that is I will be your God, you will be my people. If you're disobedient, you'll bow down to that which is worthless and pathetic and can do nothing for you. You'll make an idol, false gods. He says, you'll make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him. Again, anger, jealousy, pain, heartbreak. You'll provoke pain in God's heart. He says, I call heaven and earth as my witnesses. Your honor, you know, it's in a, a courtroom scene. Your honor, I call heaven and earth as my witnesses. 
Like that's a powerful statement. It's like a courtroom scene. God goes, I'm, I'm, I'm actually in a court case against you and I'm calling heaven and earth to testify against you. So you make an idol and all of these things. And then he goes, here's what's going to happen. You will quickly perish from the land. Again, it's very specific, the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. So they crossed the Jordan when they went into the promised land. You shall not live long on the land. You will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, the peoples, the Gentiles, the nations. You will be few left in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. Most of you and your family members, your children, your children's children will be killed. And the few that are left will be exiled among the nations as prisoners of war, as exiles, kidnapped, whichever term you want to use. Again, very specific warnings. These are not just vague general. He's not like bad things will happen. It always amounts to invasion, decimation, and exile. That's the ultimate chastisement. So again, that chastisement cycle. And then when you're in the land, you'll remember me. And I won't forget the covenant that I made with Abraham. I'll bring you back to the land. So Deuteronomy 4, 24. When you're in the land, there you will serve gods, foreign gods, the work of man's hands, wood and stone. They don't see, they don't hear, they don't eat, they don't smell. Why? Because they're not even people. They're nothing. It's a piece of wood and stone that you carved. And then he goes, but from there, after you've had your fill, you've bowed down before their gods, from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. You'll repent, right? So that cycle, I don't know if you've seen these cycles online. People make these different types of cycles. People have made them with regard to empires. And then they go, how are we faring as the United States? And they go, so you have a people that yearn for liberty and freedom and and re release from oppression from dictators, and then they find it, they attain it, and that's what the United States did, right? Like, not that long ago. We fled oppression and dictatorship. We came over here. We established a place of liberty. We have a constitution that calls us to a place of equality. We've fallen short in that many times, but nevertheless, that's what we, uh, that's what we are fighting for is equality, liberty, freedom, right? But as these cycles happen, then people, they attain the freedom, they attain the liberty, but then they choose to give themselves over to become reliant on the government, and eventually it becomes a dependency society, the government becomes a dictatorship, the whole thing implodes and collapses, people suffer, they know what it's like then to live under oppression and dictatorship, and to work all day and have nothing, and then they cry out and they yearn for and they fight for freedom and liberty again. It's a cycle. They get it, they lose appreciation for it, they give it up, they feel the pain, and then they cry out for it again. And these things can play out over a few hundred year period, right? So whether it's Israel or the United States, and by the way, it's a, you know, when it comes to certain things, you don't need to be a prophet, you just need pattern recognition. And that's where we are right now. Pattern recognition, we as a nation are at the tail end of that cycle. We're coming into the place of, living under dictatorships. And this has nothing to do with political parties. It's just the nature of the history of mankind. He says, you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress and all of these chastisements, all of these things have come upon you in the latter days. The term there in Hebrew is ha'achrit, which is the tail end, the, the the hind end of the days, ha'achrit hayomim, of the days. It's the last days. So here is actually, all the way back in Deuteronomy, Moses is making an end time prophecy. He ultimately says, in the last days, you will return to the Lord. So he's speaking to Israel. Now, of course, this pattern, by the way, and we're going to talk about it, has played out multiple times in the history of Israel. But he goes, there will be one final, ultimate cycle in the last days. You will return to the Lord your God and you will listen to his voice. Why? Because no matter how disobedient you are, the Lord your God is a compassionate God. 
He's speaking to Israel. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor will he forget the covenant that he made with your fathers, the Abrahamic covenant. He goes, even when the chastisements of the Mosaic covenant come upon you, he won't forget the promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was a unilateral, single-party promise from heaven upon death he promised these things. He goes, even when you deserve it, in my compassion and mercy, I'll give you the gift of repentance. You'll return to me, and then I'll bring you back to the land. And his mercies. So in the church today, half of the church says, Israel disobeyed one too many times. And he divorced them. He got rid of them. He walked away from them forever. And we're the new bride. We're the new, yeah, the new bride, the new people of God. That's what half of the church today believes. And then we have the audacity as a bunch of former pagans to sing and say, Thank you, Lord. No matter how many times I sin, I repent, and your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And then Israel goes, yeah, but is his compassion not new for us every morning? No, you unfaithful whatever. God's compassion is for me. You go, no. He said right here, he will not fail you. His, he's a compassionate God. He won't forget the covenant. That there will always be a remnant. There will always be a remnant. And it's in that remnant that he rebuilds and starts over again. Okay, so I just done an extensive long teaching. Laid out the concept of the blessings and the curses of the covenant and the specifics of what would happen. Took a lot of time to explain that. These are basic biblical principles. Listen, guys. To understand the blessings and the curses of the Mosaic Covenant, this is Bible 101. Every Christian should understand these things. If we, un if, if we want to understand most of the Old Testament, if we want to understand most of what has unfolded historically with the people of Israel, we have to understand these basic principles of the blessings and the curses of the covenant. This is... Like, it, this is necessary to understand so much of the Bible and to understand what's unfolding right now in the news. Okay, now when we look at the history of Israel, according to the words of Moses the prophet, according to the words that God spoke through the mouth of Moses, according to the prophecies that we just read, Israel fell into disobedience exactly as Moses said they would, exactly as the Lord said they would through Moses. You had the Assyrians invaded. Now, after King David, by the way, just a couple generations later, and remember from last night, the Lord said, someone will sit on your throne forever, David. Your throne will last forever. David come, becomes king, and then Solomon, and just like two generations later, the kingdom splits. It fractures. You had the northern kingdom, which was the ten tribes in the north. That was called Israel, the kingdom of Israel. Then you had the two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin, and that became known as the kingdom of Judah. And they had Jerusalem, by the way. So the Lord promised to David that his throne would last forever, but within two generations it fell. And then you had the Assyrians invaded in the north, and they killed most of the people took the few that were left remaining and they dragged them away as exiles and they lived among modern-day Iran and Persia and ancient Persia, and which is, by the way, I just have to mention, even unrelated to the message that today in Iran, which is front and center in the news in the midst of all that we're talking about, they're the ones that were behind Hamas, they're the ones that are behind Hezbollah, that under the nose of the Ayatollahs and one of the most satanic cults governments in the world is one of the fastest growing churches in the world in the nation of Iran. I love, I love the Lord's, um, it's not sarcasm. It's almost like sarcasm. He, he has a, he kind of, you know, when you get online and you, you troll people, they call it trolling. Like God's kind of a troll to Satan. You know, Satan's like, God, I'm going to raise up and establish this government, and they're going to kill. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, pff, I've got one of the fastest growing worship movements in the world right under your nose. <laughs> you know, and Satan's like, ah! 
I knew you were going to do that. And the Lord's like, I knew you were going to say that. Anyway, Satan's like, you're always like three steps ahead of me. And the Lord's like, I'm like a gajillion steps ahead of you. You know, it's like the Matrix. The Assyrian invasion destroyed and eliminated the northern kingdom. And then that was in the 8th century, so about 200 years later, in the southern kingdom of Judah, you had the same thing with Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Disobedience produced exactly what the prophecy said would happen, down to the detail. Most of them were killed. The last thing the king, David's grandson, saw was Nebuchadnezzar killed his sons and then burned his eyes out with a hot iron, like brutal, horrific stuff. David's throne was like a tree. The prophets used the language, was cut down. Cut down, the kingdom was gone. You go, but the Lord said, someone's going to rule on your throne forever. What the Lord didn't explain is that there would be a big pause. When Jesus comes back, he will restore the throne of his father David according to the promises of God, and then the throne will last forever. But this is so important, and again, I'll make this point multiple times, is that most Christians don't understand that Jesus is coming back to restore the royal Jewish Davidic monarchy. And he will rule the whole entire planet. So right now, there's all of the talk on social media and in the conspiratorial world about how the Jews rule the world, even though the Jews, percentage-wise, make up much less than 1% of the entire global population. They control the whole world. They control the banking. They control Hollywood. They control everything. And there's like this theory that they rule the whole world, which is just total nonsense. But the day is coming when a Jew will rule the world. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches. And whether we're Jew or Gentile, that is our hope. That's everything that we're looking forward to and longing and yearning for. Not because he's Jewish, but because we look forward to his benevolent rule. But he is Jewish. Like it's an important point that most Christians don't realize. He's not just coming back to establish some Christian beautiful utopia. He's coming back to restore the Jewish throne, the Jewish monarchy. And that's our hope as Gentiles. That's everything that we embrace the cross daily. We lay down our lives because we're looking forward to the day when the Jewish king will fulfill everything that was promised. So between the Assyrian invasion and the Babylonian invasion, the the chastisements of the covenant were fulfilled. The prophecies were fulfilled. They left, but then as we know the story, and by the way, the northern Assyrian exiles and the Babylonian exiles all together, after 70 years of exile in Babylon, we know the story of Daniel. After 70 years, it's, I I might even have a verse in here. I do, okay, actually I'm going to read it. After 70 years, Daniel, Daniel the prophet, was studying Jeremiah the prophet, And he realized, Jeremiah said the exile would last 70 years. I love the fact that a prophet was studying the Bible, a different prophet, and he understood biblical prophecy. And then he goes, oh, wow. And he recognized and realized what was unfolding right in front of him in the earth. Right? I just love that interaction. So then they returned to the land. But by the way, it was not just the Babylonian exiles. It was not just Judah and Benjamin, it was also the ten tribes, the exiles that had gone with the Assyrians, they came back. So when you see in Nehemiah, you see references to all of Israel, all of the tribes returned. Because there's these weird theories that the ten tribes disappeared, and there's all kinds of crazy weird doctrines out there. No, the Bible says all Israel returned at that time, because they're all in the same part of the world, over there modern day Iraq and Iran and so forth. Okay, never before in human history, please hear me, never before in the history of mankind has a nation been completely wiped out and destroyed and eliminated, and then like a hundred years later, or in the case of the northern kingdom, 300 years later, 
the people return back to the land and repatriate, reestablish, and become a nation again. It's never, ever happened except for with Israel. And that is exactly, down to the detail, exactly what the Lord said would happen through Moses in Torah. Do you see what I'm saying? The people of Israel, the people of Israel and their history, they are like a test. They're like a barometer. And if we understand the biblical narrative, all we have to do is look at Jewish history and say, my goodness, the God behind this book is God. The things that he said, the details that he laid out happened exactly as he said, which means that the rest of the book and all of its claims and all of its, his claims on our lives are real. It's not just some weird bunch of religious people that get together on a Saturday morning to talk about the Bible and you guys are weird. We're weird. We are, but that's fine. All right, I'm weird. Um, it's not just some religious thing. It's real. It's real. And it's demonstrated like in front of us all in human history if we simply look at the Jewish people. But here's the thing. It didn't just happen once. It's never happened before in the history of mankind, yet you can look at Israel's history. We've got all of the historical secular records to prove it. They were, at, they were invaded, destroyed, exiled among the nations, and then after a time, according to the words of Jeremiah, exactly 70 years, they returned to the land and they reestablished the state or the nation, the kingdom of Israel, I guess, and they, were, they, they reestablished it. Then in the first century under the Romans, which started in 70 AD with the Roman occupation of Israel. And then eventually, of course, you know, under Titus, they burnt the temple and so forth. And then over like really like the next 50, 60 years, the Jews were rebelling. It ultimately led up into the second century, what was called the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. And eventually the Romans literally purged the entire nation of all Jews, like removed them all from the land they turned Jerusalem into what they changed it. They turned it into a temple to Zeus. Think about that. Up on the Temple Mount, it became a temple to Zeus. And they, I'm sorry, not Zeus, Jupiter. Zeus was the Greek name, same God. And they named Jerusalem Jupiter Capitolina, which in Latin is just the cap, Jupiter's capital. There were no Jews left, and then for almost 2,000 years, the few that were left that were scattered among the Gentiles, among Europe, Russia, all over the world, Yemen, the Middle East, Northern Africa, Morocco, Spain, etc., they started returning. Well, there was always like a few, you know, that lived there, obviously, like a very small number, but they returned, and right in front of our eyes, and many of us in our lifetimes... 1948, they were reestablished as a nation. 67, they took back their capital, Jerusalem. And not once, not once, but twice, the covenant chastisement cycle played out and a people were completely destroyed, eliminated, purged from the land, exiled among the nations, and then after a while, eventually, they returned. Not once, but twice. The state of Israel, the people of Israel, are one of the most profound proofs of the God of Israel that we can imagine. And unless we understand these basic concepts of the curses and the, co the, blessing, the blessings and the curses of the covenant, if we don't understand Israel's history, again, this is a basic biblical history 101, we won't understand one of the most powerful proofs of our faith that's right in front of us. This amazing tool, when we're talking to unbelievers, when we're talking to ourselves, maybe we're struggling, when we're talking to Christians that are on the fence, those who are skeptical, the evidence is right in front of us, right in front of us. Okay, so I wanted to lay out this principle. From here, we're going to springboard. We're going to get into some more prophecies that are unfolding, again, in very detailed, specific ways, right in front of us in the news, on the ground, outside, 
that prove that this book is true, that prove that the story this book is telling is true, which means that the next steps in the story are coming down the pipe. I've got one verse here that I'm going to read, and then we'll kind of shift into the next phase of the message. But I just had to read this because you can see in Daniel, Daniel chapter 9 is the chapter in which Daniel the prophet is studying Jeremiah and he realizes, wow, everything that was prophesied has come to pass and the time is up. We've been here in exile as a people 70 years. Daniel must have been really young when he got exiled and here he is now an old man. It's funny how fast, how long and how fast life flies by and here he is, fast forward, he realizes it's all going according to the words of the prophets. But watch this. Because it's just beautiful to see Daniel having that moment. In, in a sense, the same way that we can have a moment of awakening now as we're studying the scriptures. As we, I just, I'm always using the word story. Because the Bible tells a story. It's a linear unfolding story that has a beginning and an end and a destination point. And we're looking forward to the coming of Jesus, the day of the Lord, the establishment of his kingdom and righteousness on the earth. There is a story unfolding and we are players. It's not just a story that we read about. Oh, that's an interesting story. We're in the story. We're part of the story. There's nothing in the world that says any one of us can't be major impactors within the story. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not something we're passively watching. We're part of it just as much, not just as much, but as Daniel the prophet himself. Or let's just put it this way. He was just a guy. I don't care who it is. Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, they were all just schlubs like us. The Lord used them. It's an important point to remember. So here's Daniel having one of these wow moments. So in verse 12, Daniel 9, verse 12, he's reading Jeremiah and he says, thus the Lord, he realizes the Lord has confirmed his words, which he has spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring us great calamity. He's talking about the chastisements of the covenant. For under the whole heaven, there has not been done anything like what has been done to Jerusalem. He's like, we suffered complete, absolute desolation exactly as he said he would do. As it is written in the law of Moses. There it is. As it is written. You know, we need to be people who can point out at what's unfolding in the earth and say, this is what was written. That's apocalyptic evangelism. As it was written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. And then it's amazing. This, it's one of the most beautiful prayers, in my opinion, in Scripture. Daniel prays and he repents on behalf of his people. And he goes, God, forgive us. Fulfill your words. He doesn't just passively sit back and wait for prophecy to be fulfilled. He recognizes that prophecy said it would happen. And then he partners with God and actually participates in its fulfillment. It's an amazing little addendum to what we were just talking about. Now I'm going to shift <clears throat> and discuss something, the term I'm using is the controversy of Zion. What is the controversy of Zion? What are we talking about? And this is another foundational, basic principle that permeates scripture, and we all, every Christian needs to be familiar with this because it helps us to understand what's unfolding in the earth right now in a profound, profound way. So Isaiah 34, there's various passages that we could look at. Isaiah 34 is a judgment oracle on Edom, the kingdom of Edom. Edom was an ancient kingdom. We talked about Moab and Edom last night. They were sister kingdoms, I mean, right next to each other, formed by some of the descendants of some of the uh, Abrahamic family members. You know, they're all kind of cousins. And, you know, the Arabs in Israel, they're all cousins under Abraham. But the Edomites are, you know, the uh, children of Esau, if you will. 
And so there's this judgment oracle on Edom, and it's not just a historical judgment. Oftentimes the prophets are speaking about events that were relevant in their day, events that were unfolding either in their immediate future or in their near future, but oftentimes they prophesy through those events as they look forward to the conclusion of human history, or not even not human history, but the conclusion of this current wicked age. I would argue the age that we're in right now, like the years that we're in right now, that we're stepping into. So Isaiah 34, it says, Draw near, O you nations, to hear and listen, O you peoples. Again, it's almost kind of like the language of a courtroom. Everybody gather around. Let the earth and all it contains hear, all the word, the world, and all that springs from it, like everybody, everything, every animal, every ant, every tree, gather together and pay attention. The Lord has something to say. The Lord's indignation, his anger, is against all of the Gentiles, all of the nations. It's a judgment oracle against the whole world, all the peoples. His wrath is against all of their armies, their hosts, their multitudes. He has utterly destroyed them. Now, let me just say this. The Lord, the Bible frequently uses hyperbole. Hyperbole is where he says he has utterly destroyed them, which means there's not a single one left. He's utterly, it just means a really severe destruction. It never means every single last one. You'll see that. He'll say, he will utterly destroy you. And the next sentence he'll say, he'll leave very few of you left, you know, and that type of thing. But it's, when, he's, when he's really conveying things, he oftentimes uses hyperbole, which is like exaggerated to convey something in a really emphatic way. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to the slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their corpses will give off a stench. The mountains will be drenched with their blood. There's an example of poetic hyperbole. The mountains are drenched with the blood of the nations. Very poetic graphic language. All the hosts of heaven will wear away and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. There is classic end time apocalyptic language. The sky will roll up like a scroll. It's like the creation itself wears out and it's time for the new creation, for the king to come back to restore Eden, as I said last night. So the context, just to begin, is eschatological. Isaiah was speaking to events in his day. There was a judgment that was coming on Edom, but it's ultimately far bigger than any historical judgment. It is talking about the last days. And Edom... Although it was an ancient kingdom, in prophetic texts, it, it comes to embody all of the enemies of Israel, all of the enemies of God. Oftentimes, it's used in a much broader way. And the Lord uses the language of a sacrifice, but it's a judgment sacrifice. He says, my sword is satiated in heaven. What is a sword hungry for? Blood. My sword is full. It's stuffed. It's got its full. It's got everything, all of the blood it could ever want. My, my heavenly sword is satisfied. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom, the people that I have devoted to destruction. The Lord in his sovereignty has plans to destroy multitude, to judge a multitude of peoples. Jesus himself, as we saw last night, the blood-soaked warrior, will execute justice. And justice will not happen unless there is judgment, bloodshed. Like we would love for him just to come back and wave a magic wand and have there be a bloodless um, judgment, but that's not how it works. The sword of the Lord is filled, it's covered with blood, it's sated with fat, the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of kidneys and rams. It's using the language of a sacrifice, sacrificial rams, goats. And then it says, for the Lord has a sacrifice, there it is, in Basra. Basra is another name for Edom, the land of Edom. Now, 
I don't want to get off into this too much, but as we saw last night, you have all of these passages that speak of Yahweh God Almighty coming from the south. He's shining like the sun over Mount Sinai, over Seir. Seir is very close to Basra. Over Teman, over Mount Paran. He's marching, shining like the sun from the south. You go, I thought when Jesus comes back, he just lands on the Mount of Olives. There's actually numerous passages throughout the Bible that say that he will actually retrace much of the path of the Exodus as he marches from the south as the greater Moses actually setting his people free from prison, from being prisoners of war, from prison camps. It's weird to use that language, but he is the Messiah that... He didn't just come to die on the cross to save our souls. He's coming back literally to save his people from the armies of the Antichrist, from his enemies. And much of that is concentrated on the region of Basra, which is in the modern-day Jordan. Basra means sheep gate or sheep pen. Some people believe it's actually Petra. The mountains themselves, because of the way they were formed, it, that area was referred to as the sheep pen because there's only kind of one gate in, one gate out. And the idea is that many of the um, refugees of Israel, when Israel is invaded by the surrounding nations, a massive multinational invasion of the land of Israel, that many of them will flee to the neighboring nation of Jordan and end up in Petra and, the, and, and throughout the whole region. And then the Messiah himself will come and march in this procession and set his people free. And as the shepherd will set his sheep free from the sheep pen. It's just sort of a backstory that's in a lot of the prophetic literature that a lot of people don't realize. And I actually suspect, although you can't prove it, that when Jesus said, like, my sheep know my voice. He says, if anyone climbs, if they don't go through the sheep gate, they're not the shepherd. If someone climbs over the wall, they're fake. They're not a real Messiah. And he's saying, I, he's essentially saying, I am the one. I'm the shepherd that's going to set my people free from the sheep pen. I'm coming in the gate and we're going out the gate. It's, again, a fairly technical storyline that's told in the prophets. But Isaiah is touching on it here. The Lord has a sacrifice. He's going to kill many of his enemies in modern-day Jordan, in Basra. The Lord has a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Wild oxen will fall, young bulls, strong ones. Their land will be soaked with blood. Their dust will become greasy with fat. Why? Why, why is the Lord killing everyone? Because the Lord has a day. Our gospel teaches us that there is a day. There is a future day that is coming when he will return. It's called the day of the Lord. He says, it is a day of vengeance, a day of justice, a day of recompense. Here it is, a year of recompense. Why? For the controversy of Zion. The scriptures speak of something that will be so, it will so impact the earth that it will actually result in Jesus himself getting up off of his throne in heaven at the right hand of the Father and coming down and slaughtering and killing and judging his enemies who are the enemies of his people. It will actually move the Lord's heart, so much so the injustice that will sweep the nations is so severe, he says, my judgment is against all the peoples. I'm against all of their armies. And I'm coming back to slaughter and carry out a sacrifice in the land of Basra. That's just, it's not the only place. And he goes, because there is a day coming. It's a day of vengeance for, he doesn't say I'm coming back to save all of you persecuted American Christians because they're really being harsh to you all on Facebook. I'm kidding, I know. There's real persecution here in the States. You know, we, we, sometimes, just as a side note, I get people that are like, we don't know persecution. We don't know what real persecution is. We don't know what it's like to be in Iran. I get you, there's some truth to that. It's much more dangerous in Iran. But the reality is when 
the woke mob or the angry mob shuts down your business because you won't bake a cake for a, you know, chameleon alien who wants to marry a possum or whatever. I'm just kidding. But you go, that, that, that violates my conscience. Well, then we're going to attack you and shut you down. That's real persecution. That affects your family. Now you have to move. Your kids have to go to a different school. They're depressed. They're, you know what I mean? Like, that's persecution. There is real persecution here. There's pain. I don't care if it's small pain or big pain. Pain is persecution. I don't want to underplay it. But for the most part, we don't really know persecution yet. We really don't know the hard stuff yet. We're starting to feel it. But the Lord doesn't say I'm coming back because I hear the cries of my people in Wisconsin. He says it's for the controversy of Zion. That's the issue that he chooses to highlight as the motivation for Jesus to return. Now again, I want to be clear, I'm not creating some weird doctrine. He comes back for us. He does come back to save us. The whole story of the book of Revelation is about the vindication of the patient ones, the vindication of the persecuted ones. And as I said last night, the Bible was written by persecuted people for other persecuted people. And if you're not persecuted, sometimes we don't even understand what it's saying. It's all about there is a deliverance coming. We, you know, bear this patiently, suffer, embrace the cross to the finish line. He will save us in a very real, literal way. He's coming back to save us. So you have this thing referred to as the controversy of Zion. It is a, as I said, foundational concept in the Bible that we all need to be familiar with. Now, what does it mean? What is it, how does the controversy of Zion play out? We're going to look at Joel chapter 3, an incredibly important prophecy. There's multiple prophecies throughout the prophets, very, very similar. We'll look at a couple. But in Joel chapter 3, it says this, Behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah in Jerusalem. Now it's interesting, a little bit of backstory. Joel the prophet was alive around the time of Isaiah. It was, I don't know, a hundred years or so before the Babylonians came and destroyed Judah. They were in the kingdom of Joel was in the kingdom of Judah. And he knew that the judgment was coming. And he's speaking of the time after the restoration. And he goes, behold, in the days after Israel is restored, after I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. And then he goes, guess what's going to happen? I will gather all the nations and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is Jerusalem. So here was Joel, let's say a hundred years before the Babylonians came, killed most of his countrymen and exiled them back to Babylon. And then he goes, after they're restored, there's going to be another ultimate invasion of the nations. That's pretty darn specific, isn't it? It's much better than these guys in Las Vegas who go, you know, you, sir, in the front row, you know, and they do some mag magician parlor trick. The biblical prophets, the things that they saw, the spirit that was moving them, they're not generalities. They're specific prophecies. And if we pay attention, you go, that's profound. That's profound. And like uh, Moses who talked about, um, wait, was it Moses that I was just reading? Yeah, the, in the latter days, the Ha'achrit Hayomim, Joel also was ultimately looking to the last days, the days that we ourselves are alive, living in. Here we are. We live in the days after the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem have been restored. In our lifetimes, we saw the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem restored. We saw the state of Israel repatriated, reestablished. They have become strong. We're living in the fulfillment of these days. And he goes, when that happens, he says, at that time, behold, in those days and at that time, I will gather all of the Gentiles and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, so if you're in, well, in fact, Yep, check it out. That picture of Jerusalem that you're looking at at the bottom of the screen, that is, yes, that's, the, that's what you would see if you were standing on the Mount of Olives and you're looking across what's called the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley is a valley, it's a park. 
and you're looking across at the Temple Mount. The Kidron Valley, don't put that one up yet because that'll confuse everyone, but we will put it up later. The Kidron Valley is also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The um, tomb of Jehoshaphat is down there in the Kidron Valley. There's the tomb of, um, I think, Absalom, and then Jehoshaphat. There are these shrines, I guess. And um, so when it says, I'll bring them all down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, it just means Jerusalem. He goes, I'm going to gather all of the nations in a military invasion, and they'll end up in Jerusalem. When? When's that going to happen? After the days in the distant, distant future when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. After Israel has been restored. After they're destroyed by the Babylonians in the distant future. Now, you could say, well, Joel doesn't talk here about the Roman destruction and exile and restoration. Okay, you know, again, the prophets, it's like, well, I didn't know, I haven't been to Wisconsin much, that you guys have the bluffs, you know, the little hills. I didn't know that you guys have little mountains, they're little mountains, but when you're in a place where you've got mountains, you, you can look across at a mountain peak and go, oh, I'm going to walk there. You don't realize there's about six mountains in between you and that other mountain. They're just hidden. And that's kind of how the prophets are. They look out at these mountain peaks, and sometimes there's mountain peaks in between. He says, I'll bring all the nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment with them. So here's Yahweh God Almighty, the God of heaven and earth, the God of Israel, and he says, I, I am going to gather the nations, the Gentiles, their armies against Jerusalem. I'm going to do that. And then once they've done what I motivated them to do, then I'm going to judge them. Where? There at Jerusalem. When will he do that? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of his angels with him. Then he says, then I will restore my throne of glory, my glorious throne, the throne of his father David. And then he says, and I will gather, Jesus said this, I will gather all the nations before me and I will separate the sheep from the goats. Jesus talked about Joel chapter 3, knowing that this is Yahweh God Almighty, and he said, that's me. I'm the one that's going to judge the nations in Jerusalem. We'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. He says, there I will enter into judgment with them. Why? On behalf of all of the suffering Christians of the earth. Do you see it there? He says, on behalf of my people, my inheritance, Israel. Wait, so I'm getting upset here because I thought the Bible was all about us and the Lord is done with Israel. He's divorced that old unfaithful woman. We're the new bride. Joel, I mean, Isaiah just said that he's coming back. He has a day of vengeance for the controversy of Zion. Here in Joel chapter 3, he says, I'm going to enter into judgment with all of the nations on behalf of Israel. Well, maybe he means spiritual Israel. Maybe he means us. No, he said, after I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will bring them out to the valley of Jehoshaphat. You can get on your Google Maps app right now and look it up. It's a location. It's a spot. And he goes, and there I'm going to enter into judgment on behalf of my people, the ones who live in Jerusalem. There's no spiritualizing of this stuff. Let me just add this as a side note. <clears throat> Whenever hatred of the Jewish people rises up, as it always does in almost every generation, this irrational, insane hatred of, Jew, of the Jewish people rises up. Always there comes with it all of these weird tropes, these lies, these, these little cliches about them. They, you know what they do? Back in medieval times, this was a common thing. They would say they kill Christian children, they kidnap Christian children, and they take their blood and they put their blood into their matzah crackers. And they eat the blood of Christian children. You go, that's ridiculous. These are things that were Christians believed for hundreds of years. And they taught them. And then because of that, they're like, the Jews are killing Christian children. We need to kill them. And the Jews are like, we have not kidnapped any. We're not putting blood in our crackers. These crazy conspiracy theories. Well, one of the tropes that's very common today, you're seeing it in some different cultic movements, but you're also even, see, even seeing it in the church. 
I'll call it YouTube conspiracy. You know, when you get all, and you know, I say this as a YouTube preacher, but when you get all of your theology from YouTube, there's some weird stuff out there. We need to be aware of these ideas and recognize that they're stupid. <laughs> um, one of the theories, or theories are, yeah, one of the ideas is that all of the people in Israel today are fake Jews. They're not really even Jews. They're just a bunch of white, colonialist, European fakers occupying, you know, there's just all these different things that come in. It was funny, by the way, let me just say this. Well, I'll, uh, do I want to even talk about this? The thing, okay, so with the Marxist education today, everything is anti-colonialist. It's the indigenous peoples were invaded, you know, usually it's the brown peoples were invaded by the white peoples and destroyed. And look, that's a legitimate issue of justice, and it's a reality. But with Israel, they try to appropriate that and use it. The problem is the Jews are the indigenous peoples. They are the original peoples. If you go to Hawaii today, the locals are the Hawaiians. The Portuguese and the Japanese and the Europeans, the white, Caucasians, they're the foreigners. The indigenous peoples are the locals. You go to Israel, and the indigenous peoples are not the Arabs. They're the peoples that came much later, but they've been there a long time. You can say they're indigenous too, but it's Israel who are the original indigenous peoples. The old pagan Canaanites, they're all gone. God gave the land to Israel, and here's the thing. So first of all, the whole paradigm of indigenous, it's just wrong. It's just simply wrong. They've been there for thousands of years. Yes, they left and they came back. And also the paradigm of white-brown. It's not true. You go to Israel, and yes, there's plenty of white people. There's also plenty of Ethiopian black Jews. And the majority of Israelis are just as brown, many of them browner, than the Arabs. But over here in the United States or in Europe, we have these paradigms and we impose it onto them Anyway, so there was a, a video that just came out. I want to remember it properly. And it just has all these Israelis, and they go, okay, say, just say this into the camera. Say, I am a white colonizer. I am a white colonizing occupier. And it's just all of these, you know what I mean, brown, Middle Eastern, and black people going, I am a white colonizer. And they're like, and then like it shows the video and they go, wait, I'm supposed to say what? And they go, <laughs> and they laugh and they're like, I am a white colonizer. Like, like they're just trying to say the propaganda that is sweeping the nations today is stupid. It's not even real. Israel is a very diverse nation. Does it have Europeans? Yes. Does it have Sephardic or Middle Eastern Jews? Yes. Does it have Ethiopian African Jews? Yes. Is there racism in Israel? Yes. It, you know, just like any place else, it's a nation. The theory, uh, sorry that I'm, I'm even talking about this, just, these are the ideas that lead to irrational hatred. The idea is they'll say, well, all of the Jews that are in the land of Israel today, they're Europeans. They were part of a kingdom that used to be in Turkey years ago called Khazar. The Khaz they, it was the Khazars. And they were Caucasians, um, Indo-Europeans that converted to Judaism sometime during the medieval period. And they're not even really Jews. And all of the Jews in the land today are these fake convert Khazar Indo-European Caucasians. Was there a group that converted to Judaism years ago? Yes. But there have been scientific genetic studies that say, like, there's not even a sliver of a very small fraction of the peoples who live in the land today who are actually Khazarians. But here's the thing. So this is like this. I know you go, what are you even talking about? Believe me. You can find a thousand videos about this on YouTube. And people are, like, believing it, preaching it from the pulpits. Those people are fake Jews. We're the true Israel. It's, it's theological racism. But here's the thing. When you get to Joel chapter 3, the word of God, does God say those people in the land are a bunch of fake Jews? No, he says in the last days, which is now, after I've restored the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, he goes to the people who live in the land now, 
he refers to them as what? My people, my inheritance, Israel. This settles the argument. The argument's done, okay? But you go, that was kind of a weird diversion, Joel. Believe me, if you haven't heard this, you will hear it. Because these ideas, they grow and they swell, and people embrace them, and they think, ah, I'm smarter than the other guy that's next to me in church. I know the truth. I watched the YouTube videos. And by the way, just as a side note, Judaism is not simply ethnic. It is ethnic. It's the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then you have all of these people who joined themselves through covenant. So you could be Japanese and convert to Judaism because Judaism is not just ethnic, it's covenantal. And if you say, I convert to Judaism, you are joining yourself to the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. And you can be fully Japanese or you could be from Ghana and you are just as Jewish as anyone else. You're Jewish now. You're not from one of the 12 tribes, but you're fully Jewish. So Jewish Judaism really, it's a strange thing. Is it an ethnicity? Is it a religion? Yes, it's ethnic, but ultimately it's covenantal. And so these conversations are kind of technical. Paul deals with it. He goes like a true Jew is someone who is both Jewish and who has a heart of worshiping God, you know, this, this type of thing. So it's important to recognize it's not, who cares what ethnicity they are? That doesn't matter. If they grew up Jewish, identifying in covenant with Israel, they're Jewish, period. You know, I've got a little bit, a small sliver of, um, of, of Jew in me, but I'm like the most non-Jewish person in the world. I grew up, I did not go to synagogue, you know. I was just eating some pig before I walked out here. Just kidding. But I will. If you give me the opportunity. Whom they have scattered among the nations. So the Lord's... Now watch this. Sorry for my, all my rants. All my little side points. The Lord says the day is coming through Joel. After, in the very distant future, after I restore Judah and Jerusalem... I'll gather the nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will judge them on behalf of my people Israel. Why is the Lord in the last days so focused on Israel? Because he's responding to the controversy of Zion. He's responding to this thing that will sweep the globe, this controversy that will seize the earth with regard to Israel. We're seeing the controversy of Zion right now sweep the earth this irrational hatred of the Jewish people. I watched a video just last week of a couple. Because what everyone says, they go, oh, we don't have any problem with Jews. Jews are fine. We just don't like the Israelis, the occupiers. We don't like what they're doing. Well, then why, when a simple couple walked out of synagogue in New York City, they walked out of their synagogue. They were met by a mob of anti-Israel protesters who chased them down the street, screaming at them, yelling hateful things, calling for their murder. They're just Jewish. They have nothing to do with Israel. Okay, so all of the facade of saying, oh, this is, I'm just, no, I love Jewish people. I have no problem with Jews. I just don't like Israel. We're seeing the, no, it's a hatred of Israel. It's a hatred of all Jews globally. It doesn't matter where they live. Europe, the United States, the Middle East. And then it says this. Why will the Lord judge the nations? Are they just all visiting Jerusalem? No, they're invading militarily. And then it explains, again, I want to focus on the specificity, the details of what the Lord chose to speak through Joel. Now, again, remember, the time how long ago this was? This was close to 3,000 years ago. Close to 3,000 years ago. And Joel said, in the last days, I'm going to gather all the nations down to Jerusalem. I'm going to, the Lord says, I'm going to judge them. Why? On behalf, he says, I'm going to judge them on behalf of my people Israel. And then he says, because they have scattered my people among the nations. Again, it's the language of exile. It's the language of prisoners of war. It's the language of hundreds of them who have been kidnapped by terrorists and invaders. 
So he uses the language of exiles among the Gentiles, and then he says, and they have divided up my land. They have taken my land, which I promised on my own life to give to them, and the nations have divided and split up the land. This week, this week, the Biden administration said they are very seriously considering simply declaring recognition of a Palestinian state. In the same way that, and this is not a political thing, I hate them all. <laughs> Just to be clear, I don't hate, I love everyone. It's a love-hate relationship. In the same way that the Trump administration just declared recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, because everyone else said, no, it's Tel Aviv, the Biden administration is saying, we're just going to diplomatically declare recognition of the Palestinian state. The UK immediately said, we're going to do the same thing. Okay, to, and this is a big deal, because as soon as a state officially becomes a state, right now, um, they, if they want real serious weapons, they have to smuggle them in through Iran. Once a Palestinian state is recognized as an official state, they can get nuclear weapons. According to all of the you know, international laws, they can get any weapon they want. Turkey could immediately give them you know, F-16s, whatever, and it is on. It, there, there will be guaranteed full-blown war in no time. Israel's very existence will immediately be threatened. So it's not just something, hey, we're going to, you know, recognize a Palestine. It, it's the, if you really understand what the implications are, it's almost, the Biden administration is almost threatening the very existence of Israel as a nation completely. And he says, they have divided up my land 3,000 years ago. Joel talks about the land being invaded, the people being taken as prisoners of war, them dividing up the land. He's talking about the sins of the nations. And then he uses the language of human trafficking. And I don't know if you've followed everything with the 200 plus kids and people, not kids, but most of them kids, kidnapped. Many of them have been murdered, raped multiple times. Many, many, many of them. And it uses the this very language. They have cast lots for my people. They've traded a boy for a prostitute. They've sold a girl for wine that they may drink. It uses the language of human trafficking, of exile, and now they're bartering with them. It's very specific. It's not just vague, general things. These are things that Joel prophesied. Now watch this. Verse 4. The Lord says, moreover... What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon? Tyre and Sidon were cities in modern-day Lebanon. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, that's the map. And I just pulled this off the Internet, which means it's wrong. But um, that's beside the point. So here's the state of Israel in green. The pink Dark pink areas are the Palestinian territories, but the problem is up in the Golan. They have Golan as pink. It's, it's part of Israel. But really, in the center, you have the West Bank, and then down there on the left, you have Gaza, the Gaza Strip. Just north of Israel is Lebanon. Moreover, the Lord, he gets into the details. He goes, all the nations are invading Israel, but now I'm going to point out a few in particular. What have you against me, O Lebanon? Does the Lord have a problem with Lebanese? No. Does the Lord have a problem with Lebanon? No. He has a problem with people who allow their hearts to become vessels of hatred and racism. That's where his problem lies. But he doesn't simply say, you have a problem with the Jewish people. He goes, what have you against me? When the nations are enraged against the Jewish people, he personally identifies and goes, you got a problem with me. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why are they devising a vain thing? Psalm 2. They take their stand. He doesn't say they take their stand against Israel. He says they're taking their stand against the Lord and against his Messiah, against Yahweh and his Moshiach. Okay? Ultimately, their rage is not against the people. It's against their God. 
and God calls it for what it is. But then he highlights Tyre and Sidon. Who controls Lebanon today? Hezbollah, right? The single most powerful terrorist organization in the world right now, funded ideologically, given support from Iran, Lebanon. So the Lord through Joel says, what have you against me, O Hezbollah, in all you regions of Philistia? That's Gaza. In one verse, actually a fraction of a verse, in the context of the last days, when the nations invade Israel, divide up the land, scatter the people among the nations as exiles, as prisoners of war, that they engage in human trafficking with the people in the land, the Lord, through Joel, chose to specify the regions of Hezbollah and Hamas. That's just a coincidence, Joel. Me, Joel. The prophet Joel just happened to randomly, coincidentally get it right 3,000 years ago. What a lucky guy. Point after point after point, detail after detail after detail, exactly the words of the prophets are being fulfilled in the news right now, right in front of our eyes. Do we have eyes to see it? Do you see what I'm saying? It's too specific. This is not just random. And then here it is. He says, are you rendering me? Do you, you think you're paying me back for something? Notice he goes, I'm upset personally. It's not just against them. Because the Lord has some harsh things to say about the Jews. Right? The Lord himself, like a father. I can say all kinds of things about my kids. I can joke. I did earlier. But if someone else says them about my kids, that's a very different story, isn't it? If I'm in the grocery store and I go, you know, my kids are too old now, but, you know, sit down in your seat. <laughs> Quit complaining. I'll get your SpaghettiOs when we get to the spaghetti aisle. Whatever. Um, I can do whatever. I, I can yell at my kids. I can discipline my kids. If someone else disciplines my kids in the grocery store, there's going to be a problem. I'm going to take them behind the yogurt you know, I don't know, whatever. I'm going to grab me one of them Slim Jims and just start slapping. No, I'm just kidding. All right, whatever. Um, <laughs> I could just keep going. I would take a can of the SpaghettiOs. And, okay. The Lord says, are you rendering? He takes it personally. Are you rendering me a recompense? And then he says, if that's what you think you're doing, if you think this is about justice, now what is the... When we see the protests in the streets, tens and hundreds of thousands marching all across Europe, all across the United States, all over the world, throughout the Middle East, and these are, you know, Muslims and Palestinian immigrants, and look, they have every right as Americans to protest and this and that, but then our kids are joining them because they're all indoctrinated in the universities, and our kids think this is the, the new trend, the new justice issue of the day, and they're out there in the streets openly calling for a racist genocide. Exterminate those Jews from the river to the sea. Palestine must be free of Jews. Go back to Europe. They're like, we're not from Europe. I'm from Yemen. My family's from Morocco. Go back to Europe. And then they go back to Europe. They go back to the United States. And how are they treated there? I was just in the Netherlands. I was talking to this guy. He goes, we're Jewish. He was a believer, a messianic believer. He goes, my kids? He goes, we live here in the Netherlands. We've grown up here. He goes, my kids cannot go down the street with a Star of David. They will be violently assaulted by all of the Muslim immigrants. He goes, they're afraid in their school that anyone will find out that they're Jewish. They hide the fact that they're Jewish. Go back to Europe. It doesn't matter where they go. The satanic rage will hunt them down. And the Lord says, you think that you're, you think that you're um, going after them? He goes, no, you're, you're coming after me. He goes, if that's what you do, I will swiftly and speedily return your own violence, your own recompense on your own head. This is not karma. This is justice. The day of justice is coming. Okay. Zechariah 14. In the same way that Joel chapter 3 
describes the last day's insanity, the gathering of the nations, the invasion of the land of Israel, and all that they will carry out. Zechariah 12 through 14, is one big contiguous prophecy, lays it out in detail. Again, specifics. Zechariah 14, 1 through 4, Behold, the day is coming for the Lord, when what's going to happen? The Lord says, the spoil, the stuff that they steal from you in war, it will be taken and divided among you, right in front of you. You will watch as they take your property and divide it amongst themselves. The Lord says, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Here's what's going to happen. The city will be captured. The houses will be plundered. Think back, if you watched any of the videos of October 7th, the house is plundered. The women raped. Half of the city will be exiled. Half of the city will be taken as prisoners of war to the surrounding nations. The rest of the people will not be cut off. Where's that detail come from? It comes from the inspiration of the mind of God. He goes, half of the city will be allowed to be left to remain. Now, today, Jerusalem is divided between East and East Jerusalem is Arab Jerusalem. It's, almost, it's already essentially a divided city. How did Zechariah know that? Zechariah was more like, say, 2,500 years ago. Uh, yeah, ish, 2,500, 2,600 years. Zechariah said, in the last days, the city will be divided. Today, the city of Jerusalem is divided. Then the Lord, when that happens, the Lord will go forth. Again, he will come from heaven in blazing fire with all of his angels with him, marching majestically, shining like the sun, rays shooting out of his hands. Plague goes before him. Pestilence follows in his steps. On that day, the Lord will go forth and fight. Like, that's intense. The God who spoke and the universe came into existence is coming back to fight against his enemies. In those days, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. Like, whoa, get on the right side. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east. He will make it to Jerusalem and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. I don't believe he descends from heaven directly to the Mount of Olives. Because notice it doesn't say in that day his feet will land on the Mount of Olives. It just says his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. I believe, as I said, he actually comes, delivers his people, and there's a procession. Psalm 68 speaks of the procession of God as he makes his way up to Jerusalem. And then eventually his feet will indeed stand on the Mount of Olives. So whether it's Joel chapter 3, Zechariah 14, they're all describing the same thing in detail. And I would say, even as the blessing and the curses of the covenant of Moses describes, first, it's a little detachment from Babylon. They come in. You know, there's a, there's a catastrophe. They kill a bunch of people. They, you know, whatever. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a party that comes in and does something. Again, 9-11. The people don't really pay attention. They pay attention for a little bit. But then some years pass and they forget about 9-11. And then there's, this happens and then they forget about it. But eventually the armies come. Eventually the big invasion comes. I just lost my train of thought. Oh. October 7th, if you pay attention, if you watch what happened on October 7th when I don't know how many terrorists came in from Hamas, from Gaza, and many of them, by the way, the reason that they were able to plan and that they knew where to go and what to attack is because Israel has visas where they allow, I forget, it was like 20,000, 30,000 from Gaza every day to come in and work in Israel. And so the very people that many of them were working for were gathering intel so that they could come in and slaughter them. The majority of Israelis, if you go to Israel, they don't talk bad about the Palestinians. They want the best for them. You go to the Palestinian territories, the conversation's a little bit different. That's beside the point. October 7th was a small picture of what Zechariah describes here. The city will be captured. The houses will be plundered. The women raped. Joel describes it. The nation will be divided. They will be exiled among the nations. They'll divide. They'll trade 
a boy for a prostitute, a girl for wine. October 7th and the events that have unfolded since then, it's like a small prophetic picture of what's coming when the Antichrist and all of his armies enter Israel. All of the, the atmosphere throughout the nations is ripe for Joel chapter 3, for Zechariah 14, for Ezekiel 38 and 39, for Daniel chapter 2, 7, 10 through 12. All of these prophecies for Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, all of the things that are described by multiple prophets, multiple passages throughout the Bible, it's all ripe. The atmosphere is ripe for these things. The very things that you see in the prophets, the words that are spoken, you hear it spoken from presidents of nations right now. Are we paying attention? I'm going to go a little longer here and then we'll um, wrap it up. As I said, the so many of the, I say our kids, I just mean, you know, Kids that were raised maybe in church or maybe not, but Western kids, they're buying into this thinking that it's an issue of justice. So ignorant. And don't get me wrong, but the kids, our kids are getting educated. They're being discipled by TikTok. Sitting in their room, just flipping through their videos, getting enraged, getting upset, thinking that this is the issue. And believe me, the October 7th stuff, they know how to wage the propaganda war. They don't know, they know not only how to engage in actual warfare, an invading of a nation, which is what it was. It was a surprise attack, an invasion. They know how to wage the propaganda war. And they are influencing our brain-dead children and grandchildren. I'm just going to read a quote from the Charter of Hamas. Again, people are like, no, Hamas is a liberation organization. They're freedom fighters. They're occupied. They're suffering. They're persecuted. They have every right to do what they did. They have every moral, just right to murder, rape, kill, plunder, kidnap. It's an issue of justice. They're oppressed. You can throw off the oppressors. That all sounds good, doesn't it? You know, I mean, I hate to say it, but if... I had people bombing my neighborhood, killing my neighbors, killing my family. I'd become a freedom fighter too. I get it. But it's not reality. It's not real. Let me say this before I read this quote. I don't think I have a picture of this. The story of David and Goliath. I thought I threw a picture of this in somewhere. I'm just going to leave it. I'll, I think I get it later. I'm going to read this quote. This is from the Charter of Hamas. So, again, I talked about the American Constitution. To be clear, it's one of the most beautiful documents in the history of constitutions of any nation. To be clear, it's a document that we have fallen short of. We have failed to live up to these ideals, but they're beautiful ideals worth fighting for, worth contending for, equality for all peoples is worth contending for. Liberty, freedom is worth fighting for. Okay? This is the constitution of Hamas. They've changed it since then because they got so much flack probably 15 years ago in the UN and it was not very good propaganda so they changed it. But their goal remains the same, 100%. This is a prophecy, an Islamic prophecy allegedly from the mouth of Muhammad himself. And it says this, the day of judgment will not come about until the Muslims fight the Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind a rock or a tree and the rock or the tree will cry out and say, oh Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. And then it goes on, I should quote the whole thing, it says Hamas, which is a longer name, it's um, Hamas exists to fulfill this divine mandate. And it, it says we will not stop until we fulfill it. In our constitution it says we should fight and contend for equality for all peoples. The charter of Hamas says they believe it is their divine destiny that God has commissioned them to commit a genocide and to kill Jews. And that is why we exist. It actually says that is the reason we exist. 
And then we have all these stupid Western kids joining them and supporting that, thinking they're supporting a cause of justice. That is the idiocy, the insanity, the demonic insanity that is sweeping the nations right now. Does that mean that there's not suffering in the Palestinian territories? Yeah. I got in a big fight with this guy on Twitter. Um, he was a New Testament professor. He's a Christian, a theologian, a teacher at a Christian uh, college. He used a fake name, but I just did a quick little search and figured it out and called him out. He immediately blocked me. But he was just, because he doesn't want to be exposed as being a hater. A, a, a literally, I mean, just calling hatred toward the Jewish people, but it's his theology of replacement, replacement theology that leads to it. And he was just trashing Israel, basically supporting Hamas. And so to speak their language, when I say their language, I mean, you know, Gen Z, and they're always upset about different things. And they, I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound... Um, uh, and one of the big things they're upset about are, are the one percenters. What they mean by that is this top 1% of the population that has the vast majority of the wealth while the rest of us suffer. They are incredibly excessively rich, the CEOs, blah, 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 blah. They're keeping all the money and we are suffering and exploiting. The poor of the earth are suffering. And there's some reality to that. But I said to this professor, I said, you're sitting there celebrating and supporting Hamas. I said, what is Ismail Haniya worth? Ismail Haniya is one of the top founders and leaders of Hamas. He does not live in Gaza. He lives in Qatar. They have condos and mansions in Turkey, in Qatar. I said, what is he worth? I want you to answer me, and I want you to say it right here on Twitter. Is he worth a million He's the leader of this suffering, oppressed movement of people. Is he worth 10 million? What is his net worth? Is he worth 100 million? Is this guy who's recruiting money for the oppressed peoples, how much has he put in his bank? Is he a real freedom fighter? Is he, does he have 100 million dollars? Does he have a billion dollars? That is $1,000 million. How much does he have? Say it. He blocked me. Ismail Haniya is worth $4.4 billion. You talk about one percenters, and he's out there crying on behalf of his people, raising money. He's not just a billionaire. He's worth $4.4 billion. The whole thing is a facade. It's a joke. They don't want peace with Israel. They want their people to suffer in order that they will be enraged because they weaponize their own people so that they can remain in their mansions, live in extravagant wealth. It's the most cynical, deceptive bunch of bull that you can imagine. And you've got these kids, particularly that are educated in college, watching TikTok, celebrating with them, calling for genocide, openly calling for racist murder of every Jew in the earth. My daughter, a couple years ago, in high, she's now 19, she goes, Dad, why is it? Why? She goes, I don't get it. Racism is bad. All my friends know racism is bad. My white friends all know racism is horrible. My black friends all know racism is horrible. But both my white friends and my black friends all are racist toward Jews. They make fun of Jews. They tell Jewish jokes. They hate Jews. They think it's funny. They celebrate racism toward Jews. Why? Why is it okay to be racist with this one people? I'm like, because that is exactly what the biblical prophets said would happen. That's what God said would happen. That's the atmosphere that we're living in right now. I'm going to show you this one last picture. Two pictures I'll show you. This is difficult. This is from the Nova, Supernova Festival. This was the concert that was down there on the border of Gaza. The vast majority of all these kids got slaughtered. On the picture on the right, 
they were just taking pictures like, oh, look, a bunch of paragliders. What's going on? They're probably all tripping, whatever, you know, dancing, ecstasy. And, oh, look, these were terrorists that were coming in with AK-47s that were going to just in a few minutes start slaughtering people left and right. On the left is a picture that was not seen widely. There's some videos. I just did some Googling before the message and uh, found that. What did the Lord say in the blessings and the curses of the covenant? He said, when you enter the land, the ultimate embodiment of rebellion is you will make false gods. You'll bow down to them. And that's when you know the final judgment is coming. Israel today, the vast majority of Israel, and this is so painful because it kind of makes it me feel like I'm saying it's the Jews' fault. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is the words of Moses, the greatest of the prophets, as it says in one passage in the Bible, the words of the Lord through Moses, their prophet declared that when you bow down to foreign gods, here's what I'm going to do. Because our God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. If you provoke me to anger, here's what's going to happen. And as painful and as horrible as that is, you can see biblical prophecy. You can see pattern recognition. You can see these things being fulfilled specifically. The whole concert was under this giant Buddhist statue. A false religious teacher who may even have had some good principles, but he was not. Even, I mean, he was just an ancient cult leader who was very successful. And then you hear the stories when the terrorists entered and started slaughtering in so many interviews I watch. And it just tears your heart out. And these kids, because the concert, you can see some of the trees in the background. It was next to a big forest. And, the kid, and by the way, it was a peace festival. These kids were all probably just, you know, going to a concert, dancing, taking ecstasy, whatever. But the whole idea was they were sending peaceful vibes over the wall into Gaza. Hey, we want you to know that we love you and we want the best for you. And they came over the wall and killed them and massacred them. Two different spirits, neither of which is of the Lord, by the way. And the kids described, they go, I was hiding behind a tree. I was hiding under the bushes. I was hiding under the dead bodies of my friends, and I watched as the girl and the guy that I drove down there with were murdered as they begged for their lives right in front of me. I watched as my friends were slaughtered. It's almost like the charter of Hamas, even though it's a false prophecy about the day that Muslims will be hunting down Jews hiding behind a tree or rock. It's as though that was like a prophecy from hell itself. Again, it's just prophetic pattern recognition. You see these things and you go, that's exactly what Satan spoke through the lips of Muhammad. And that's exactly what's in the hearts of so many of these people. They're raised on it. I'm going to actually end here for the afternoon. I know that, go to the next slide. This was the follow-up in the days and the weeks afterwards when it all went down. Hundreds of thousands. That's in London. That's in London. You could do the same thing in New York City. You could do it all over the world. The rage of the nations, the controversy of Zion is currently gripping the nations. We could do this all day. We could go through the prophets and talk about all the different ways that biblical prophecy is being fulfilled right now, right in our day. These are actually as painful and as hard as it is these are actually tools that we can use and we should be able to use we should be able to expound the scriptures properly to point unbelievers to this book because the window is closing the opportunity to repent and to give our look the bottom line is there the window will close the time will come when they will knock on the door and he will say i never knew you the door is shut it's locked and I'll be honest with you, I'm, I can go to the Middle East and share the gospel, but when it comes sometimes to my own neighbors and friends, I sometimes get intimidated, I shut down. We have the message of life, we have the words of life, we, have, we are stewards of something called the gospel, it means the good news. 
And it says in the Bible that it is the message whereby, it is the only message whereby men might be saved. It is the power of God for salvation for those that believe it and repent and, and embrace it. And how will they hear without a preacher unless we open our mouths and have the courage to love our neighbors, to love our friends, to speak the truth, to share the gospel, and to call them into it and say the hard things, which, again, there is a freeze sweeping over the whole world. I remember when I was the Western world. I, I remember when I was younger and I would read about Soviet uh, Russia, the, the Soviet Union, and people, or even just Eastern Europe, and they would be like, we grew up, we were afraid to talk. And I was like, and guys, obviously, I talk a lot, and I'm from Boston, and you know, whatever. Um, I was like, that's stupid. Like, why would somebody be afraid to talk? Like, I couldn't even, reg I couldn't even wrap my head around it. And here I am, a preacher, a big mouth, loud mouth guy that talks constantly, Probably too much. You guys are, don't say amen. Um, and here it is. I'm like, I know. I get it. I'm afraid. We're all afraid. We're afraid to open our mouths. We're afraid to talk. We're afraid it might be misinterpreted. We're afraid it could get us in trouble. We're afraid we could get canceled. Afraid we, afraid we could get fired. Open your mouth. Let's open our mouths. We have the words of life. We are stewards of the only message whereby men might be saved. It is the power of God, of heaven and earth, for salvation to save men. If we, if we don't take our own salvation lightly, we should take others' lack of salvation very seriously. Let's utilize these things. And in the process, let's stand up in solidarity with the Jewish people. But let's also speak the hard things, which is to call them back to faithfulness to their God, to obedience to the covenant, to obedience to the marriage covenant that God made with them, to call them out of that secular, rebellious state. That's where it's hard. It's, 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 it's hard enough to stand in solidarity with people. It's hard enough to become friends with someone, but then to call them and say, you're missing a huge part of who you are. You're actually in rebellion. That's where the friendship can get cut off. We have to be willing to suffer the stigma of speaking the truth. So amen and amen.